The Shroud of Turin is about to be examined in a way it has never been before. The most famous thing about the Shroud now is that it is a medieval fake and not the burial cloth of Christ as millions of people have believed. That was the verdict of a carbon-14 test done exactly 20 years ago. But the irresistible force of science seems to have hit an immovable object. New evidence has appeared which contradicts the results of the carbon-14 test. So why won't this image of a naked and battered man just lie down and die? There's one very good reason. No one has been able to work out how the forger did it. No one, despite many attempts, has been able to produce an image with the same physical characteristics. It's a mystery. And into this vacuum has rushed a new and for many unthinkable question. Is it after all not the shroud that may be found wanting, but the carbon-14 test applied to it? On the 20th anniversary of that test, physicists are preparing a new carbon-14 test. It will show if the original carbon-14 test could have lied. So just what is the new evidence relating to the Shroud of Turin? And could it resurrect the Shroud as the most potent relic of Christianity? embarking on a journey that will span three continents and take me to the very heart of Christian history and to the people that have closely examined the Shroud. Turin sits in the plain at the foot of the Alps in northern Italy. This is the home of the Shroud, the Cathedral of John the Baptist. Well, this is quite a moment for me. My first awareness of the Shroud came when I was at school in the 80s. A lot of new research appeared to hold out the prospect that it was indeed the most important relic in Christendom. The last time the Shroud was shown was in 2000, and it's not due to be seen again until 2010 at the earliest. Visitors have to make do with the sight of its fireproof case. But already there's a surprise in store. Something remarkable has just happened. News has come to me from the Cardinal Secretary. The Cardinal has agreed for its veil to be lifted for us. In this side chapel, the windows are being blacked out and the humidity and temperature carefully measured. Under considerable secrecy, this room is being prepared so that our camera teams can film the shroud for the first time in high definition. While the preparations take place, I want to understand the key features of the shroud. The first thing that strikes you is that since the carbon-14 test, the church makes no claims for its authenticity but it does maintain its importance as an object of devotion. Behind that glass and beneath that cover lies the finest Italian engineering, designed to keep it safe and in an atmosphere of inert gas, monitored minute by minute. Professor Bruno Barberis is the curator of the museum dedicated to the Shroud. And a visit to the museum begins with a film. An intriguing revelation is that throughout its history, the shroud has often been displayed in public. It may seem like a trivial detail, but it could be important to the investigation. Could the shroud have been contaminated in any way and so distort its true age? Another relevant detail is that artists have tried to imagine how the cloth must have been wrapped around the body to create the image of the front and back. The answer could shed light on the age of the cloth. 
1532, a fire melted the metal box in which the shroud was kept, and it left behind a geometrical pattern of burns. Miraculously, the image was preserved intact. And finally, a piece of information that goes to the heart of the debates over the age of the shroud. All we can know for certain is that before Turin, the shroud can only be reliably traced back to the village of Lire in France, where it was in the possession of this man, Geoffrey de Charnay, who first exhibited it in 1360. That date is very significant because carbon-14 dates the shroud at 1325, plus or minus 65 years. It all seems to check out. My first impression of the shroud, then, is that, on the face of it, it would make sense to dismiss it as medieval forgery. But as I'm about to discover, there is more, a great deal more to this cloth than meets the eye. The day for the filming has arrived. These will be the first high-definition moving images ever taken. To protect it, only the minimum amount of light is used. It took me a while to pick everything out, but then it became quite clear. Lying between the geometric patches from the fire, the image of the front and back of a man's body, with what seem like scourge marks and the very specific wounds of a crucifixion. The cloth itself is about four meters of linen with traces of cotton. It has a distinctive herringbone weave and the scorches from the 1532 fire. These show it was once folded in 48. And another curious set of L-shaped scars show that at one time it must also have been folded in four. These observations could be important. This is the image the shroud reveals to the naked eye. But with the help of some technology, the eye can see more. By first removing the color and then reversing light and shade, we create a negative of the image. Photography first captured this a century ago, but today it can be done at the press of a button. This is a clearer image of the figure on the cloth. This is the true positive. It's the image on the cloth that is in fact a negative. This is the camera which revealed to the world a much clearer image of the shroud. In its negative form, the shroud was somehow more recognizable and easily discernible. And what's more, photography meant that the image of the shroud could travel far and wide, and interest in it began to grow around the world. For believers, the appeal was irresistible the shroud seemed to hold out the promise of a tangible contact with Christ himself at the crisis of his suffering on the cross. And here were the key identifiers, the wounds from the lance in the side and the crown of thorns. But carbon-14 ended that hope and many religious hearts were broken. A couple of generations have since grown up knowing almost nothing about the shroud, but whatever the result of the carbon-14 test, the shroud has remained an enigma. And the enigma is this. If the shroud of Turin is a medieval fake, then how exactly was the image forged? Lying in the shadow of the Rocky Mountains in the United States, is Colorado Springs, 
It's the home of the man who has studied the shroud closer and longer than anyone else. John Jackson is a doctor in cosmology and lecturer in physics. Together with his wife, Rebecca, he runs the Turin Shroud Center of Colorado. Through his research, he has had one of the few full-size high-definition still images of the shroud for some time. In 1978, when interest in the shroud was at its height, he led a large team of scientists to Turin, where they examined the shroud for a week. No one since has secured such full access to the cloth. Significant amounts of different types of data were extracted. Jackson became the primary custodian of this data, and he has continued the work. Only now does he feel ready to share his findings exclusively with us. Unlike everyone else, Jackson wants to solve the riddle of the shroud. If it's a 14th century forgery, then how was it done? Could a medieval artist have created the distinctive properties of this image? The first thing Jackson established is that the cloth can be wrapped around a body. The blood stains on the back and front of the cloth match exactly where they should. Place it over the three-dimensional man that we have here. Now, I'm going to uh, pull this intentionally straight. And I would like to, you to notice, first of all, that this blood stain right here yeah. is, which is this at the bottom of the feet, right. is totally... It's hanging it's, off the end. Yeah, it's totally off image. Look what happens when we make the, the, the hands mm -hmm. align Fits. properly. Yeah. Look now what happens to the blood stain at the, at the bottom of the cloth. That matches. Roll it back. It it's exactly where a nail would have been. Once key features were aligned, everything else fell into place, even the stains from one end of the cloth to the other. If we're dealing with a medieval relic, then it's one that's been meticulously created. And we know that the blood stains are not paint. Jackson's team identified it as blood in 1978. But what of the image itself? The image on the shroud has some very interesting characteristics to it. And these are not only interesting, but they're scientific characteristics. The simplest hypothesis is that the forger painted the image. The proof would be the presence of a medium to bind the pigment. We are going in now to a close-up of the darkest part of the image, the nose, and further to a microscopic picture of the same area. The image is only on the surface fibrils of the cloth. These fibrils, which are on the order of the size or the diameter of a human hair, they, these are the fibrils that are twisted together to make threads. If you look, these fibrils are individually colored. They bear that, that color that is the body image at the microscopic level. Notice that those fibrils are not cemented together by any kind of paint. What we see, and this is the observation, microscopically is that the individual fibrils of the shroud are colored. To get a better understanding, we need to look at the cloth sideways on. If we magnify its thickness, we find that the fibrils that bear the image are literally just on the surface. Nothing has seeped into the cloth below. What this observation uh, does, and this, and this illustrates the scientific method, is the hypothesis of an artist using a, a pigment has some viscosity to it is excluded, I believe, by this singular observation on the shroud. If the image is not a painting, Jackson considered the idea that an embalmer subjected a real body to the horrors of crucifixion and then wrapped a cloth around it. But a simple look at the image of the face shows that contacts between the body and the cloth alone could not have formed the image. 
the eye sockets and the other recesses of the body, as well as the hair at the side, would never have been in direct contact with the body. And if they were, the resulting image would look like this. If the image is a fake, it can't be the work of either a painter or an embalmer. Of course, the carbon-14 test still points to the shroud being a medieval relic. But Jackson has identified two properties of the image that a forger would have had to reproduce, properties that only modern technology can detect. The first is the fact that the naked eye only sees a negative image of the body. This is important because if we're going to think of the image as being the work of an artist, then it would seem that what you, ha you have to deal with is the idea of somebody composing the image in a negative reverse to the way we normally see a human being and put this onto a piece of cloth, a long piece of cloth, with a, uh, with a technique which also has definable characteristics. And this is a very difficult thing to imagine. You have to remember that whoever would have, or hypothetical artist, would have not had the luxury of being able to check his work. The second unique property of the image is one discovered by Jackson himself, its three-dimensional quality. He discovered from his experimental wrappings that the intensity of the image varies with the distance the body is from the cloth. The tip of the nose, for example, is darker than the hollow of the eye. I wanted to know if we could see this with our new high-definition images. And sure enough, with the simplest press of a button in our editing suite, this 3D quality is revealed. I was astounded when we were able to do this that the brightness surface that you create by the computer looked, as you can see here, very much like a three-dimensional person, particularly the face. If you look at the facial structure, you've got the nose in proper relationship to the cheeks, which are in proper relationship to the eye sockets and so forth. These special properties of the cloth narrow the options. Maybe the forger was a sculptor. A medieval technique for creating both properties is bar relief. A sculptor creates a 3D model in stone or metal. To transfer the image onto the cloth, the bar relief is heated and the cloth placed over it long enough to be scorched. It's an option that Jackson has experimented with. The real test of this method is whether the heated sculpture can scorch an image on the surface and only on the surface of the cloth. So I used that, making a hot bar relief, trying to impress that on the cloth. And yes, you can get some images that could have some pseudo three-dimensional quality and also a high resolution. But the problem there is that to put a surface discoloration on the cloth, on the fibrils, heat will discolor through the thickness of the shroud in about, uh, it's about one one hundredth to one tenth of a second. So you would have to have the, the bar relief on the cloth and take it away on a time scale like that in order to be consistent with what we observe. So it just goes on and on. Uh, but the, but problems that just don't seem to work. To avoid this problem, some tests have daubed paint to transfer the bar relief onto the cloth. The result does show some negative and 3D qualities. The trouble is that they are distorted and crude. Also, this method uses paint, and the absence of any evidence of a binding medium on the cloth does rule that out. I must say that, uh, that anyone who wants to try to explain the shroud image, and, and this work needs to, needs to continue most definitely, but it, it one has to make sure that you've, you're, you're working on a hypothesis that can explain the totality of all image characteristics, and you can't just go Not and just pick and choose. Base, yeah. You can't pick and choose what you want, and that's all too often what happens. Science says the shroud is a 14th century fake, but so far, 
no one has found a medieval technique to accurately reproduce the image. No wonder the fascination with the Shroud of Turin continues. The search for a method of creating the image on the Shroud will go on. But in the meantime, the failure is raising a new and controversial possibility. Is it possible that the carbon-14 test itself was in some way flawed? It's a possibility that's gaining currency because there is new evidence that places the Shroud of Turin earlier in time. Historians have identified another Shroud of Christ in the 12th century in Constantinople. And what I want to know is if this Shroud could be the same as the one in Turin. If it is, it would push the date of the Turin Shroud back by at least 160 years and challenge the accuracy of the carbon-14 test. The evidence for a 12th century Shroud of Christ surfaced recently in a document called the Prey Manuscript. It's in Hungary and takes its name from the scholar who first examined it. It can be reliably dated to 1196. This is one of its five illustrations, and it shows Jesus being placed in his burial shroud. Mertil Fleury Lemberg is a textile expert who is charged with preserving the fabric of the shroud. She studied these images of Christ in the manuscript and identified a number of features that reappear on the Turin shroud. The most obvious is that the figure on the shroud has the arms crossed and the thumb hidden under the hand. On the top, you see the painting with the corpse laying on a white linen, mm -hmm. as one would expect, which is normal, a white linen. And you see the arms crossed and you see the four fingers. The thumb is... Uh, Hidden. Invisible is hidden, and that is also a connection. It's also visible the same on the shroud. Lemberg is also very aware of the geometric weave of the shroud. What is more important for a textile historian as I am, you see painted herringbone pattern. And this herringbone pattern is a typical sign of the shroud of Turin. Another feature of the cloth are the holes bunched together in an L shape. These holes here, these L holes, they are on this picture and they are on the shroud four times because it was folded in four layers. You see here yeah. small holes, a little bit bigger, and then here you see the bigger ones. Oh, I see. The the painter of this picture must have seen the Shroud of Turin. Otherwise, it's not possible because it's exactly the signs which we find also on the Shroud in Turin. If the carbon-14 test is right and the Turin Shroud dates to the 14th century, then you wouldn't expect to find the same arrangement of holes in a shroud nearly two centuries older. And yet, that's exactly what the Prey Manuscript shows. So, if the shroud now in Turin was once in Constantinople, what was it doing there? And more importantly, why do we not hear from it again until 1360? Well, this isn't Istanbul, the modern Constantinople, it's Oxford. And I've come here to speak to a man who's made the study of Christian sacred images his life's work. Constantinople had the finest and most prized relics in the world. This is the piece of the 12th century. Professor Alexei Lidov has made a study of a rare memoir of a French crusader who hunted down these relics and gives us this intriguing account. <laughs> 
It is set in Constantinople in 1204, around 10 years after the date of the Prey manuscript, and it mentions a shroud of Christ displayed in some kind of ceremony in which the shroud with this figure of Christ was raised up every Friday. Uh, I quote, amongst others, there was another of the churches called Our Lady St. Mary of Blacherna, in which was the shroud in which Our Lord was wrapped and which stood up straight every Friday so that the image could be clearly seen on it. What does he mean by the image or the figure was lifted up? A kind of rite or a special ritual uh, happened every Friday in the Blacherna church uh, related to the demonstration of the Shroud of Christ. It seems to me very probable that the Constantinopolitan Shroud and the Shroud of Turin is one and the same piece because of very rare similarities and this extremely important evidence by Robert de Clary that there was an image of Christ on the shroud. As for why we don't hear of this shroud again, the crusader Robert de Clary tells us in his memoir that at the end of the Fourth Crusade, when Constantinople was ransacked by French crusaders, no one knew what became of the shroud. But we do know that the Turin Shroud's first recorded appearance is 150 years later in France in the hands of a familiar figure, one Geoffrey de Charnay. Recent research has found that he was married to a direct descendant of one of the leaders of the Fourth Crusade. If a French crusader took the shroud from Constantinople, it would explain why we only hear from it again in the hands of his heirs. But although the shroud disappeared from view for 160 years, Professor Lidov believes a memory of the image on the shroud was preserved in the art of the period. This icon of Christ is known as the Man of Sorrows. It became popular in Constantinople when the shroud disappeared. It has many of the distinctive features of the image on the shroud of Turin, the crossed arms, the hidden thumb. And significantly, it depicts an image of Christ emerging out of a box-like tomb as if raised up from the dead. Many different versions of it exist. It was clearly a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus and almost certainly invokes the ritual involving a shroud described by the crusader Robert de Clary. I wonder if its origin might be connected with the loss of the shroud in some way. I think so. In a way, we may consider this as a kind of compensation, compensation right. of this great loss and the commemoration of the present of the shroud in Constantinople. The Prey Manuscript, the testimony of Robert de Clary and the Man of Sorrows icon all build a compelling case for the Shroud of Turin being older than the date specified by the Carbon-14 test. It's a controversial claim, but it seems to be supported by an intriguing series of features now clearly revealed by high-definition images of the Shroud. When lit from the side, the shroud image all but disappears, and from the shadows emerges another dimension, the cloth's accumulated folds. Watch again what happens when the lighting changes. Notice the horizontal creases the whole width of the cloth. Linen has a kind of memory, it creases, and if it's kept folded for long periods, these creases become permanent and a record of how the cloth has been kept. According to Dr. Jackson, it's data that can be used forensically to link the Man of Sorrows icon to the shrouds of Turin and Constantinople. Dr. Jackson identified a series of fold marks at regular intervals. A, B, C, and D. 
that reflect the way the cloth was folded during storage. He expected the pattern to repeat itself along the whole cloth. Surprisingly, it doesn't. There is no fold E between the head and the navel. Instead, just below the crossed hands, Jackson found no less than four closely packed folds grouped together in what he calls the F block. Finally, the pattern suggested that there should be a fold here by the legs. And sure enough, on close inspection there was, but oddly, it was shallower than the others. Jackson developed a program to simulate all the folds and concluded that they must have come from some kind of device, perhaps for storing the shroud. Jackson looked for clues in the Man of Sorrows icon. Not only did it depict the one area of the shroud that was free of fold marks, but it was invariably shown as something coming out of a box. Perhaps the device that had formed the folds also displayed the shroud in the way described by the crusader Robert de Clary. I've been invited to witness the unveiling of a device designed and built by Jackson's team based on the fold mark evidence and the ceremony witnessed in Constantinople. So what does this machine do and how does it possibly explain where the fold marks are in the shroud? Well, all of them were calculated as to exactly where they were. If you remember the F block, yep. the F block is this block here with the four folds around it. Right. And then we had uh, an interesting problem. We could not explain why there was a missing fold. Right. So the solution we came up with was a weighted bar. It does some marvelous things for us. First of all, it keeps the front of the shroud taut, so you always have a good face that doesn't uh, fluff like a it sail. Keeps it taut, yeah. That's right. And then it also has a tendency to pull this down right on the other side of the F block, which gives us this sharp fold here. So it answers two things is what you're saying. It answers the fact, this pole being here, why there is no fold mark at that point. Exactly. And why there is this F block marks here. That's true. Okay. And then we also saw that very shallow fold mark yep. that we saw before. That shallow fold mark is this free hanging fold right there. This? Yes, that is correct. Right. The time has come to decide if this elaborate hypothesis could be true. The Byzantines had a great reputation for creating spectacle and theatrical liturgy. Could this be the image of Christ that was raised up every Friday that Robert de Clary saw in Constantinople. In any other field of historical research, this wealth of evidence, textile, documentary, artistic, and forensic, would be enough to conclude that the shrouds of Turin and Constantinople were one and the same. But the carbon-14 test has created a barrier. The shroud of Turin cannot be older. Perhaps it's time to ask some questions about carbon-14. I've come to Oxford, site of one of the three labs which conducted the landmark tests 20 years ago. Is it possible that the margin of error of plus or minus 65 years was wrong? Should it have been wider? Professor Christopher Ramsey now runs the Oxford Radiocarbon Accelerator Unit and was present here when the original test was run on the shroud. I mean, anything is always somewhat provisional. There are always new uh, experiments you can do. Most scientific experiments are only verified by being repeated many times, and then you, you reckon if you can repeat the experiment and maybe do it in a different way, you get the same answer, you're convinced. With the shroud, you're in a slightly difficult position because obviously you can't go on dating it lots and lots of times. As a scientist, 
I'm much more interested in, in getting the right answer than I am in sticking to an answer which, which we came to before. My own hunch at the moment from the weight of, of scientific data and other data would be that the shroud is medieval, but um, I, I, don't, you know, I don't necessarily think I will always hold that, and I'm certainly open to, to inquiries that would indicate otherwise. There is an anomaly. The evidence from physics is seemingly at odds with that from history. But of course, even if it could be proven beyond doubt that the shrouds of Turin and Constantinople were one and the same, that still wouldn't make it authentic. After all, tradition claims that the Shroud of Turin is nothing less than the burial cloth of Christ. Even the 12th century is still 1,100 years after the death of Jesus. But pressure on the reliability of the carbon-14 test has continued to build with new forensic evidence that places the Shroud yet further back in time. It is something known as the Sudarium of Oviedo in Spain. It is reputed to be the face cloth mentioned in the Gospel of John. John says that the disciples entered the tomb of Jesus on the third day after his death, only to find it empty, apart from the burial cloth and the face cloth. We also know from official records in Oviedo that the Sudarium can be accurately dated to the fifth century AD. I've invited to Turin Mark Guskin, an expert on the Sudarium of Oviedo in Spain. His evidence could push the date of the Turin Shroud back another 700 years to the 5th century. This is an identical copy of the Sudarium. Its purpose was to trap blood escaping from the corpse as it was taken away for burial. Guskin believes he's identified significant evidence linking the Sudarium to the Shroud of Turin. Guskin already knew that the shroud has real blood. It belongs to the rare group AB. There are also traces of blood shed in life and blood shed in death. And finally, there are the unmistakable traces of blood from a crown of thorns on the front of the head and the back. Guskin believes all three blood features can be found on the sudarium. The first is the blood group, okay, which is a relatively rare blood group on the planet is the blood group AB, okay? And it's the same blood group of human blood on both cloths. Then there's also the differentiation between life blood, in other words, blood shed in life and post-mortem blood, which can be clearly differentiated. And again, that coincides on both cloths. And that brings us to what for me uh, clinches the whole matter of the cloths being used on the same body. Now, this was blood shed in life. Okay, while the, sub, while the man in question was still alive. Now, this blood comes from wounds that were made by some kind of sharp object piercing the skin in this area of, of, the, of the nape of the neck. Okay, perfectly compatible with what has been called since then a crown of thorns. Okay, now, if we look at this, we have exactly the same stains yeah. in the same area on the Shroud of Turin. Now, the actual shape of the stains, if you do an overlay of, of the two, well, the actual shape, you know, the way the blood flowed coincides on both cloths. So what you're saying is not only the blood types that are the same, the actual patterns of, of, of the blood on both cloths are, can be matched. That's right. That's e exactly so. Amazing. Which has led uh, more than one uh, forensic qualified forensic doctor to say that the only conclusion you can make from that is that both cloths were used on the same body. In other words, this is too much for a simple coincidence. But so let me understand, what you're saying is that the fact that we know exactly what happened to the Sudarium and its history has huge implications for the Shroud, because obviously they both covered the same man. That's right. And the only place that they could have coincided, in, in, both in, in time, was in Jerusalem, sometime before the 4th or the 5th century. You know, there's no two ways about that. They couldn't have coincided at any given time after that. Because we know what happened we to the We know exactly Sudarium. where the Sudarium was all the time. These very distinctive wounds on the back of the head on the shroud link it to the Sudarium in Jerusalem before 500 AD.
the Turin Shroud's links with the Shroud of Constantinople pushed its date back nearly two centuries. Its links with the Sudarium of Oviedo push it back by another 700 years. To be sure, none of these links necessarily make it the true Shroud of Christ. It might be that it's a fifth century fake. But there is a third shroud, the one described in the Gospels, which wrapped the body of Christ in Jerusalem after his crucifixion. Could the Shroud of Turin be that shroud? That would be the most contentious connection of all, for it would make the date of the Shroud of Turin 1,300 years older than the date indicated by the carbon-14 test. And yet, that's what new findings in Colorado are hinting at. The team studying the Shroud of Turin have identified a number of links to the Shroud of Jerusalem. First century Jewish burial cloths, as today, had to conform to strict Jewish rules and regulations. First, they had to be linen, uncontaminated by wool. Rebecca Jackson is Jewish herself, and she's found that the cloth used for the Shroud of Turin conforms precisely. According to Jewish law, you cannot mix linen and wool in the same fabric that will be touched. It's absolutely illegal. And that goes back all, way back into Egyptian culture, you know, the temple laws of the ancient Egypt. And um, the, the shroud is definitely linen with some traces of cotton that could have slipped in there. But and that's we, fine. And, we, and that's okay? That's okay. You can mix linen and cotton forever and ever but you can't mix linen and wool. Rebecca Jackson told me of another very specific link with Jewish culture. This is one cubit. Okay. And this is two, two. cubits. Okay. So this is what would have been used as a tool of measurement, right? Right. So let's check it out. That's two cubits in width, certainly, right? right? And across, yeah, that's one. That's two. Point there. Three. The shroud's dimensions are in the units used in Jerusalem at the time of Christ, the cubit. What does that suggest to you then? The whole thing checks out in terms of the measurement yeah. of the shroud in the cubit. The shroud has many of the hallmarks of a Jewish burial cloth. And Dr. Jackson believes there is evidence that connects the shroud directly to the shroud in the Gospels. The most detailed account of what the disciples saw in the empty tomb is the Gospel of John. He mentions the face cloth, but he also mentions burial cloths in the plural. That must include the shroud that wrapped the corpse, but the plural indicates that there was yet another cloth, and that has puzzled New Testament scholars. Well, Jackson believes he has identified the other cloth, in the shroud itself, in a strip of cloth sewn along one side. This is a transmitted image. It's a transmitted light image. It's an absorption image. And it's the shroud is being held up. Jackson owns this backlit image of the shroud taken in 1978. And it shows clearly that the bands of discoloration from the weaving go right through the seam from the main cloth to the strip, showing that it was part of the original cloth, then torn off and then re-sewn back on again. Could this side strip be the missing cloth alluded to in John's Gospel? Here's the side strip on the shroud. Right. Let me just show you. It's essentially the, the length of the actual shroud okay. itself. Right. Okay, so we're gonna use this mm -hmm. to finish off what I'm proposing to Explains be... Explains that right. movement of the cloth. So, uh, now remember, the bottom of the feet have blood on them. Right. And so that has to be held in place. So I'm going to take the bottom part. So let's put a small knot here at the bottom. And we're going to wrap this around and we're going to make it rather tight because we got to we have to hold the body together exactly so that's the bit that would have held 
the knees together. Yeah. As see, see what this is doing? That's it's going to hold the legs together, which which holds the knees, which is what we observe on the shroud. Now that now that we've held the way the strip fastens the cloth around the body conforms to the way the body is represented on the shroud. We're going to have to. When we look here at the bottom of the chin, notice the disruption that occurs in the cloth. I think that we can see that echoed if we go over here to the negative image. Okay. We can see the, the hair on either side of the face, but when we get down, it looks like the hair, suddenly there's a disruption, at least to my eye, and we see it over here. I think there's also a disruption in the beard. There's something here, and I would submit that that's yes. consistent with uh, what we are inducing by folding on the cloth here. Jackson's side strip theory could answer the question that's puzzled students of the New Testament. I asked Jackson if he would submit his solution to an expert on John's gospel in a real first century tomb in Jerusalem itself. I've arranged for Dr. Jackson to present his theory to Dr. Stephen Need, a New Testament scholar. So this is uh, just the sort of tomb that's referred to in the Gospels. Jackson has laid out the body in the tomb, wrapped according to his reconstruction from the shroud, complete with the torn off side strip tied around it. For accuracy, the sudarium or face cloth that John's Gospel describes is also in position. Then, just before Dr. Need's arrival, the body is removed to leave just the cloths. It's very striking to come into a, a real tomb in Jerusalem and to see um, the clothes lying there like that. It fits in with the Johannine picture, but if that piece of cloth that was torn off at the time of the burial um, was indeed a separate piece of cloth, that would explain the plural. If Jackson is right, then this arrangement of burial cloths may be a closer representation of what John's Gospel says the disciples saw when they walked into the tomb on the third day after Jesus' death. The side strip links the Shroud of Turin to the Gospel of John and the first century AD. But perhaps the most direct evidence linking the Shroud of Turin to the time of Jesus is an archaeological find made in Jerusalem itself. I've come to the Israel Museum to hear about a discovery made in 1968. Archaeologists unearthed the remains of a victim of Roman crucifixion dating from the time of Jesus. The relevant find was a single heel bone which challenged the way we imagined crucifixion and the museum has agreed to let me see it. Now what Ellie has just handed to me is the only evidence that we have of the victim of a crucifixion the key thing is that this nail did not go through the front of the foot, but through the side of the heel. Grooves on the victim's ulna bone also show that he was nailed through the wrists. These finds overturn the convention that Jesus was nailed through the front of the feet and his palms. And so they're a benchmark for the true age of the shroud. Crucifixion disappeared along with the Roman Empire. Later artists showed the nails going through the front of the feet and the palms. I would expect a medieval forger to have followed the same convention. But if the method of crucifixion is distinctly Roman, then it's more likely to be from the time of Jesus. 
I've asked two specialists, Peter Dean, a forensic medical examiner, and Dr. Neil Svensson, an expert on the shroud, to assess whether the type of crucifixion represented on the image conforms to Christian iconography or to Roman methods of execution. There are the wounds you would expect to find from the descriptions in the Gospels. The scourging, for example. The shape and size match archaeological discoveries of the flagrum favoured by the Romans in the first century. Likewise, the wound in the side matches the size and shape of the Roman lance. But for Dr. Svensson, the most telling details are the wounds where the body was nailed to the cross. A Roman crucifixion began with fixing the arms at the crossbeam. Mm -hmm. called patibulum, and if we look at the man in the shroud, yep. we see here at the wrists a big wound with blood rivulets in two directions. It's interesting because I suppose when one thinks of the, the normal pictures and representations, one I suppose is used to seeing pictures of a a nail through the palm itself, but here we're actually looking at the back surface of the wrist rather than the palm. It's possible, and yes. And you get much more support if you're going through the bony structures of the wrist rather than, say, soft tissue in the palm, which may not be sufficiently capable of bearing weight. The wounds on the feet also confirm that this was a Roman crucifixion. The Romans crucified their victims by nailing them through the heel mm. And uh, this uh, man was uh, pierced by the heel because we, we see a large outflow of blood from here. The blood stains on the shroud are consistent with this practical way of nailing, the way we now know to be the Roman way. So no one has yet worked out how the image was formed. And there's evidence that places the shroud earlier in time. In the 12th century, in the 5th century, and even in the 1st century. The conflict of evidence is such that the team in Colorado is asking whether the results of the 1988 carbon-14 test could have been distorted. Up there in the stratosphere is where the carbon-14 isotope is created as the cosmic rays hit the atmosphere. And since the shroud was tested 20 years ago, more is known about its transition from there to the plants from which the linen is made. Based on this new knowledge, Jackson and his team have developed a new hypothesis that could explain why the age of the shroud sample tested 20 years ago is younger than the rest of the evidence would suggest. Scientists have now discovered that before it's absorbed into carbon dioxide, the carbon-14 isotope actually spends up to two months in the atmosphere as carbon monoxide. If the carbon monoxide bonded with the linen of the shroud, it could have made the cloth appear younger. In fact, a 2% contamination is all it would take to distort the age of the cloth by 1,300 years. Let me understand you, in layman's terms, right? If you can establish here that there has been this contamination of the, of the material, it would mean that the shroud material would have been therefore dated much earlier than it actually is. Well, it would, it would mean that uh, the radiocarbon dating of the shroud uh, would have dated a contaminated sample that uh, uh, would mean that the radiocarbon date was, was incorrect. The team is now getting ready to begin the long process of testing the new hypothesis. Using samples of modern linen, the team plan to carry out a series of tests to find out whether its true age can be distorted. The experiments will take some time. They need to submit the samples to all the possible conditions that the Shroud of Turin itself could have been subjected to. Its storage, extreme heat, 
ultraviolet light, handling, water, and so on. The tests could help resolve the anomaly at the heart of the study of the shroud. The time has come to ask Professor Christopher Ramsey at the Oxford Radiocarbon Unit. If the hypotheses which John Jackson had come up with do have any validity scientifically, if they do stand up to, to experiment, they will have much wider implications as well for other samples which might have gone through the same process. So it's, you know, it's part of the scientific inquiry to continue to, to investigate um, possible ways of improving techniques and so on. The Oxford Laboratory has agreed to test the samples being prepared by Jackson's team. And the first batch of samples of linen in normal storage conditions is ready for Professor Ramsey to test. How have these preliminary samples tested? And does Professor Ramsey feel there is any future for this investigation? The significance of this particular hypothesis for contamination was that it's the first that's had the, the capability, at least in principle, of, um, of shifting the date um, by, by a very large amount without very much contamination. Um, and so that's why we were doing these experiments uh, to try to see if carbon monoxide from the atmosphere would react with linen in the way that you would have to have for this hypothesis to, be, to work. The samples that we've had so far, which have been in, in fairly uh, sort of normal conditions, heated linen and stored with carbon monoxide, we haven't yet seen any uh, evidence of reaction between the carbon monoxide and the linen. So, so far, there's, no, um, there's nothing in this hypothesis that would appear to undermine the original radiocarbon dating measurements. So the question is, is there something very particular about the shroud itself and the conditions in which it's been stored, which makes those reactions many tens of thousands of times faster um, than we can, than we can uh, register with the, with the material we have so far. So I guess the search is on to see if that's the case. With the radiocarbon um, uh, measurements and with all of the other evidence which we have about the shroud, there does seem to be a, a conflict in the, in the interpretation of the different evidence. And for that reason, I think that everyone who's worked in this area, the radiocarbon scientists and all of the other experts, um, need to have a critical look at the evidence that they've come up with in order for us to try to work out some kind of a coherent story that fits um, and tells us the truth of the history of this intriguing cloth. Whatever the outcome of the new tests, new questions about the shroud will emerge. Could its image be the work of an artist from an earlier age? Or could it have wrapped the corpse of Christ? What did happen to the shrouds we know existed in the first, fifth, and 12th centuries? And how was the image on the cloth formed? The mysteries linger on. Thank you.